So this was also a period when Cage was teaching his experimental composition course at the New School for Social Research in New York before a class of students who did not know how to write music. So they presented their work to him, their experimental scores, as text. And that, I think, is an interesting potential for reverse influence where the students influence the teacher a little bit. Um, a more hybrid object than is usually supposed, 433 is situated between the two Cajun landmarks of silence and indeterminacy. It is, suspend, it is the spearhead of many, the many approaches Cage would use to change not only music, <coughs> but the very concept of the creative act in the mid to late 20th century. So the years 49 to 53, uh, which is the height of abstract expressionism and Pollock's inimitable chance technique of dripping, drip painting, these were very critical years for the artist Robert Rauschenberg. But more than this, this, they were synchronous with Cage's peak years of change. Their innovations, the innovations of Cage and Rauschenberg suddenly seemed to dovetail. Rauschenberg was trying to evacuate expression from inside of the painting um, and trying to activate the space around the painting. Uh, this is a sort of wonderful almost simultaneous uh, juxtaposition where you see the, the amazing thing was Pollock was this radical model of chance but it was all about expression. Now if we remember what I was saying about Cage you know, and the prepared piano getting rid of expression and he turned to chance so that he didn't put emotion in the work, right? So Rauschenberg, one day he said, he, he said I, I wake up every morning trying to get out of Pollock and de Kooning. You know, this was his sort of battle. So, you know, Pollock's sort of breathing down everyone's neck at this point. He's very famous. Um, and he's doing something that the next generation is going to basically despise and not be interested in. So, Rauschenberg's the one, the first figure that leads, suggests a way to get beyond Pollock. And he really does this with Cage. Um, Rauschenberg's white paintings of 1951 became the source of an extraordinary bond between Cage and himself, advancing the stakes of the works of both of them. In 1961, Cage announced that the white paintings had been the catalyst to his most famous score, that silent, non-intentional 433, an open frame in which anything can happen. Of course, it was Cage's theory and his second version of the score that pushed the theorisation of Rauschenberg's paintings into that pivotal conceptual space that they now occupy. And I have to say, there's a few interesting people that have pushed that further. You might know the work of Brandon Joseph, who's a scholar at Columbia University. He's really made Rauschenberg a lot more interesting by putting Cage and Rauschenberg together in this way. So I think that's a, a very important link. Because Rauschenberg himself <laughs> never described his work with the, the same radicality that Cage described it. Um, so, let's see. Within the next two years, Rauschenberg pursued new models of painting using the real in close proximity to Cage. So here we have on the left this tire print that Rauschenberg and Cage made together in <coughs> 1953. Everything here is 53. Uh, in the middle, you have this unbelievable work called a dirt painting that Rauschenberg made and dedicated to John Cage. So this is like chance and the given and all this sort of non-composition all at once. And then really beautiful work on the right, for which, which doesn't exist anymore, and it's why there's only a black and white picture. It was called Growing Painting. Rauschenberg showed this in New York in 1953 in a group show at a place called the Stable Gallery. And uh, it was basically sort of angled a little bit towards the wall so it had some relationship to being a painting, but it was a bed of dirt with grass seeds in it, and he came every day to the exhibition and watered it, so it, suddenly there was grass, so he called that growing painting. Why is this profound in this moment? Because it's an artwork that changes, like Cage was trying to add change to his work, and it exists in time. It's a sort of chance composition in time. Um, so the tire print that Rauschenberg made with Cage, Cage actually drove his Model T Ford, very old car, 
um, over pieces of white paper, which Rauschenberg had glued together, and then Rauschenberg sort of inked, put black ink on the tyre of the car, you know, like this, and got him to drive over it. So it's sort of the quintessential anti-Pollock, right? It's, it's chance and an index without being expressive. <laughs> um, so, yeah, the dirt, the tyre painting, the dirt padding dedicated to Cage, embodied found and the non-subjective and chance and chance-based practice. But above all, it generated a pathway out of Pollock for the next generation of artists. So in, in the late 50s, oh, uh, yeah, well, I don't know whether I should keep reading or chatting. I don't know if it's getting too boring for you if I keep reading. Anyway. Um, in the late 50s, Cage starts developing indeterminacy and he's teaching his class at, at the new school. It sort of happens in the mid to late 50s. So what you see here, in fact it's worth explaining, so here he's in Gallery 22 in Dusseldorf. This is interesting, what I found as I've been working on Cage is that many of the first things he did, like the piece at the Museum of Modern Art, and this, he always had to do it in art, art context rather than a music context, because the music people wouldn't have him, you know, so there was this sort of way in which artists, advanced artists were much more interested in, in what he was doing and in the conceptual potential of what he was doing. So there he is in Gallery 22 in Dusseldorf, which is an art space, and this work here, Music Walk of 1958, one of the very first fully indeterminate pieces, you have the remnants of grand staff notation here, right? But it's, he didn't want anyone to call it that. It was called Five Parallel Lines. Okay, so he de-skills the musical format. And then this is a grid of eight possible matrices. You get a transparency with the score and you cut it up like this. And so you just have one of those. You superimpose it on the grid and then you use the dots to line up the lines and the the horizontal lines and these lines, and you have a variable of notes, sounds, timing, all of these stuff. So it's like a do-it-yourself score. Now anyone here who knows Fluxus can understand why this would be pretty important to do in 1958. Fluxus starts in 1962, just to, I'll talk about that in a minute. But anyway, this is in Germany. Nam June Pike is one figure who's living in Dusseldorf at the time, and he attends this. Daniel Spurry, a lot of artists that here in Cage gives lecture at Darmstadt in the new music, um, sort of seeing the summer courses in 1958. So there's a lot of people that sort of come and start hearing him and hearing his ideas. And then he and David Tudor do a big tour, that I call it the indeterminacy tour. You know, right? So they're going around sort of revealing what indeterminacy can be to, to very probably mystified audiences. So Henry Flint, the artist who invented the term concept art and New York artist, he said something very interesting about Cage's work of the late 50s. He said, as, as Cage moved further and further into indeterminacy, his music assumed a structural artificiality unlike anything in the past. So it became a structure that, that other people could pick up. Now the artificiality of that structure which made it so homeless in the context of and conventions of music it assured that Cage's model and his legacy would function at a conceptual level rather than only at a musical one. So indeterminacy leads also in, in the first uh, period uh, into some performances that sort of because you can do anything with the score there's a lot of variables. But one of these early ones that he did just a little bit after music what was Actually, it was Water Walk. Right, it is so close. 